Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. There were a couple of people, men, who stepped into my life at the right time, in the right place. There were a couple of brothers that came over from Phi Beta Sigma and from Alpha Phi Alpha at the Akron University campus who made a point of coming to my school. Yeah, I'll give it to you. <laughs> came to my high school and they, they embraced me. And friends of mine, they engaged us. They, they made us talk about things. They, we talked about, they gave us, they planted in our, in our heads ideas of what manhood really is. And they worked with the people who were at my school, and a couple of men at my school did the same exact thing, pushed me to do things I didn't think was cool, uh, made me read books that didn't have pictures in them, <laughs> made me do things that, that I never would have thought about doing because I lived in one of those neighborhoods where it wasn't cool to be smart. But what they did was they messed me up so bad, I ended up winning a National Merit Scholarship and was the first boy on that street to go to college and graduate. That, that applause goes to them, because if they hadn't stepped in there, I could have gone either way. You know, it's, it's, it's so important for those of you, who, you, you young men in here, you young people in here, it is so important for you to look for an adult who believes in you, who's got time for you and we'll talk with you. And it's, t and it's important for you to talk with them. It's important for you to make that connection. And you know, life for all of us is just like winds that blow us around and every day we get a choice between being a leaf or being a sail. And you men need to understand that every single time you make a connection with one of these young men, you might be the one providing the last puff of wind in that sail that makes all the difference in the world for him, for her, for the rest of their lives. And you're making that difference might be, the, might be the difference between them becoming the next Leon Harris Jr. Or the next person that Leon Harris Jr. has to report on for the wrong reasons. And that's why we're here today. We're making sure that that doesn't happen. Now, I have a favorite, one of my favorite sayings is, uh, if you know something at 9 p.m. you didn't know at 9 a.m., it's a good day. And you are about to have a good day uh, because you're about to learn something from our keynote speaker this afternoon. Uh, you know Judge Mathis, Judge Greg Mathis from his TV show, 15, almost 15 years now on, on television. And let me tell you, I know television, that's a long run. <laughs> you gotta be good. There's been a lot of players who have come and gone in 15 years. But today, you're gonna leave here knowing that um, he is the very personification of self-determination. He started out life, you know, and, and living in, under some tough circumstances, making some bad mistakes along the way, uh, living with a challenging family, bad decision-making and all that. But most importantly for you here today, he is an example of what is possible when you listen to the counsel of the right people, take control of your life, and believe in yourself. And you are going to know that in your hearts in just a moment. Now, Judge Mathis uh, is a very, very busy man. He's got a lot of ventures that he, he's, he works with around across the country. Uh, he's still active in uh, social, uh, social causes and civil rights and all. Uh, also works with a number of charities. So he's a very busy man. But he took time out of his day to come here and share with you what is on his heart. So let's get to it. Would you please join me in welcoming Judge Greg Mathis. A decade or more later, he's one of the leading anchor persons in the country. Give him a hand. And that says a lot for determination and stick intuitiveness. I know you've heard a lot about that today from some of the uh, presenters. Also, I want to recognize a young man who has uh, began in college at the University of Michigan tutoring. He's my son. He started uh, while 
getting an education for himself, he went, volunteered at the elementary school, tutoring other young kids. I didn't ask him to do it. I never encouraged him to do it. I guess by example, he knew that that was something he needed to do. And I'm so proud of him. He now works at the U.S. Congress uh, for Gary Peters, the congressman on the Hill. And he's here with me today. Give him a hand. Greg, stand up and say hi. And I'm looking for my buddy. He may uh, be operating his radio show, but I've known him for a number of years. Uh, he invited me and encouraged me and uh, twisted my arm, quite frankly, to come. And I'm glad I did come. I'm so happy to come. He's a longtime leader in this community. Give a big hand to Rock Newman. And give a big hand to the president of Bowie State. Hand. As well, the Honorable Russian Baker, he was here with us, the County Executive Baker. Give him a hand. Not sure who's still here with us, but I do want to recognize them for coming because you have a lot of uh, leaders who are a little too busy on Saturdays uh, to come. Uh, and so we're glad for those and appreciate those who have come. And we're certainly appreciative of the woman behind the mentoring of young men. How do you like that? How do you like that? One of your leaders who happened to be a woman is heading up to fight perhaps one of the most important fights in our community to change and transform the lives of our young men. You know, many prosecutors and state attorneys, they focus on locking our young men up. Instead, we have a state attorney who is focusing on lifting them up beforehand. So give a big honorable, give a big round of applause to your great leader and guide in the court system here. Stand up and give her a big hand. Honorable Angela, also Brooks, give her a big hand. Give her a big hand. Let me begin my remarks by making a very basic observation. You know, we hear so much about our young people. We hear so much about the negative portrayals that we see in the media. That's why I'm so appreciative that our brother is here with us, Brother Harris, because he could be across town covering some shooting. Instead, he's here for you all. And let me thank all of you for coming. These young people could be somewhere at a mall, playing video games. It's a good day. You could be outside playing some ball, thinking that you Chris Paul or LeBron. But you're here today to get a message, to get direction and guidance from those whom can best instill in you the values you need for success. Give yourselves a hand. Give yourselves a hand. Because as I said, the media portrays our young black youth in the most negative stereotype. They portray black youth as more criminal minded, they portray our black young men in the media as more thugged out than they really are, more drugged out than they really are, and indeed, they portray our young black men as some type of sexual predators who are demonized in society. But the fact is, the overwhelming majority of our young people are none of those things. None of those things. 
The overwhelming majority of our young people are working, going to school, going to church, doing the right thing. But somehow we're getting this impression that they're dangerous, they're demons. When you see them, you better walk on the other side of the street. We're being programmed to fear our own babies. You can touch them. And so I thank God for them. But they are the ones you need to follow. Those are the examples. Not what you see on television. Not what you see in these videos. Because all these guys we think stay in the hood. They don't live in the hood. T.I. live in a suburb with a mansion in Atlanta. All these folks say they don't want to live in the hood. Snoop live in the suburbs of California. These guys are either, they've left the hood and transformed them lives. Or they were nothing but studio gangsters in the first place. Suge <laughs> Knight. Death Row Records, they got everybody shook up. He went to college. College boy. Puffy, college boy. Russell Simmons, the founder of hip hop, some would say. A college man. Got you tricked into thinking being tough and being thugged out is the way to prosperity and is the way to manhood. When they're sitting up in the office counting your money, yeah, speaking perfect English to the, to, to the white executives that they're dealing with at the record companies. <laughs> Got you talking out the side of your neck, talking slick. They get in them office, Jay Z's and Jay Z included. You've seen them on the interviews. He don't talk slick when he's talking to Oprah. He don't talk slick when he's with Obama. I love Jay-Z. I know Jay-Z. He is an acquaintance. But I also know, so I know how they operate. And so I say to our young people here that you must be your own leaders. Because in a real way, our young people lead the world in most of the most relevant categories. When we look at athletics, we know how important athletics are. If you don't, let me remind you and inform you that back from the dawn of ages, particularly during the Roman Empire, it was a big, big deal to have the Olympics. And whoever lost and unfortunately got fed to the lions, that's how big and important it was. And on and on and on. And well, who dominates athletics? Not only do you young folks dominate football and basketball and others, you dominate areas that historically you've never been allowed to participate in until recent years, golf and tennis. The Serena and, 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 and her sister, Venus, they, they slowed down so much because nobody could beat them but each other. <laughs> nobody can beat them, so they just laid back. Ah, let's just take it easy. We didn't. Uh. Then Tiger Woods, he was doing great. Was excellent till them 12 women start wearing him down. <laughs> you can't have 12 women and still have enough energy <laughs> to get on that golf course. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> but they lead the world. And then when we look at uh, culture, culture includes art, entertainment, fashion. We have our brother who founded FUBU, who was here with us today. Give him a hand, brother. Give him a big hand. And I'm sure you all know FUBU. FUBU was before Rock Aware. FUBU was before Sean John. In fact, I believe, if I'm not wrong, that they were the first urban clothiers in the nation. 
that were distributed in major department stores. Leaders, they led the world in fashion. Those who lead the world now in fashion are young people. When you go overseas, young folks in Japan, you see the kids with their hat turned to the side. They got their big baggy pants and they talking slick like y'all. <laughs> Following you, because you're leaders. In every area of society, when we look at even uh, 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 singing and performing, well, the person who got the most Grammys, usually it's a black youth who get nominated for most of the Grammys. And the Grammys is the highest form of music composition in the world. And we, young people like you, within five or ten years of your age, dominate. And so don't you let anybody tell you that your opportunity is limited. Your opportunity is only as limited as you allow it to be. I hear so much about how our young people are destroying themselves in our community and failing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if we believe that some of them, because that's all it is, some of them, are failing, we have to look at the root cause. And see, start, people want to point the finger, they say, well, it's the parent. Not teaching that boy at home. Sending them to school. And then probably 18,000 in Fairfax County or one of the other upper class counties per student. So what you think you're going to see when you go in these schools? And who do we blame? Who do we blame? Well, I know one group of people we can't blame. We can't blame these children for our failures. Because children don't fail us, we fail them. A child is born with a clear mind, clean hands, and a pure heart. And so it's what we put in those hands, in that heart, and in that mind, determine what our children become. They don't fail us, we fail them. In our schools, we fail them in our halls of justice. We fail them in our churches, pastors. Speaking of which, I like to get in this trouble, because they can't do that to me. <laughs> They can get up at the podium and tell their members, I want you to stop watching Judge Mathers. He's talking about the preachers. They say, oh, no, Reverend, we're going to watch him. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't stop me, preacher, talking about you. Talking about you having a $2,000 suit, $1,000 alligator shoes, Mercedes Benz, $100,000, a half a million to a million dollar house. Some of them have airplanes, Bentleys, and don't have a youth program. <laughs> and when you come to them about mentoring, they got every excuse in the world. I got to keep the lights on. I can't afford the lights uh, for an after-school program. I have to pay an attendant to be there at the church. So I, I can't afford it. It don't cost no more than $1,000 a month for everything you just described. And if you can't come up with $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year out of a congregation of 500 people, then sell your shoes. <laughs> I mean, I'm not letting you get off the hook. I'm not letting you get off the hook. The church will lead us in our community. Now you can't get them to open their doors for the most part. And I'm going to suggest to you, that is most of them. Many, many, many are doing the right thing. They have community programs, have several ministries, have full-time staffs. I got to know a pastor in Detroit, has a super church, 10,000 members. He got Two paid employees, then he got 10 of the rest of them on the volunteer tip. Mm. The janitor's a volunteer. I want you to have a janitorial ministry. <laughs> Ain't nobody getting paid. <laughs> it's
it's a prosperity church preaching to prosperity and he's the only one prospering. I'm not scared to talk about him. I have a church-based mentorship program on my internet site, askjudgemathis.com, a national church-based mentorship program. I did it in Detroit with 20 churches. It was very successful. And in this case, we give A to Z guideline, eight pages on how to implement a church-based program, mentorship program at the church. And essentially, it's very easy. The, men, the men's ministry, the pastor or a female member, you get the outline, you go and you recruit volunteers, 10 males from the church, match them with 10 young men of single mothers primarily, have them meet every week after church, either after go to dinner with the kid or what have you, for six weeks, I'm sorry, for six months. After that, you roll in another 10 men, 10 young, 10 young boy or 10 young men and 10 adult men. Match them together every Sunday. You're going to go to eat anyway after you leave church. <laughs> Take a young man with you and talk to him. Give him some direction. Listen to him. See where his head is. You going to dinner after church talking about how short sister so-and-so's dress was. <laughs> Worry about sister so-and-so. Worry about these young men. And so that, in my opinion, is one of the biggest challenges we face. It's really a dual challenge. And that challenge is the failed education system that they're subjecting our young men to and ladies. And quite frankly, I ain't scared of them either, the failure of our black fathers. <laughs> Refusing to be fathers to their sons. Essentially abandoning them. No part of their life. You don't have to stay at the house. If, 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 if You don't have to live there if the relationship not working out. If you got a divorce, fine. But you, can, you must stay in those boys' lives. Because that's the only way they learn manhood. That's the only way they learn real manhood is by being with the brothers you've heard about today. But instead, what we see are brothers who give up and go to the corner and run and drink the problems away, smoke the problems away, or what have you. And then they teach it to the younger generation who think that it's a man. They got this twisted sense of manhood, making them think they're a man because they carry a gun on their pocket or on their waist. Making them think they are a man because they can spread their seed on, to all these women and not take care of the baby. Thinking they're a man because they got this little short hustle getting the sister's money. That's not a man. A man is a leader. He doesn't depend on no woman. And then the brothers say, and I can talk about him, I was one of them. Walk around with his chest stuck out. I want my respect. I got to get a reputation. Nobody's going to respect you. If you're not taking care of those babies you're producing, and the only reputation you're going to get is that of a dead beat. And so, fatherless boys, failed school systems, that's what we're seeing that perhaps is the biggest challenge because we know that part of the root cause is denial of equal opportunity. It's economic deprivation. They move the jobs from our communities, replace the jobs with guns and drugs for us to kill ourselves with. And then those left standing, you put them in this prison industrial complex 
where now they're privatizing the prisons, paying the prisoners a dollar a day in many instances to make products that are being sold on the open market, throwing unionized workers on the outside out of work, turning those in prison into slave labor. and making money off the misery of those that have failed to educate. We know this a trap. But we can't give up, brothers. Yes, sir. They gotta fight back. Yes, sir. If you're really tough, <laughs> if you're really tough, fight back. It's like I always like to say about these brothers with the guns and doing the drive-by shooting. By definition, ain't no, nothing tough about drive-by shooting. <laughs> you ride in the car, you go at high speed, then you shoot and you run. How much courage does that take? It takes courage to fight back against the real enemy. You all kill each other, or our brothers kill each other because we look at each other as the enemy. And instead of joining together, turning toward each other, instead of against each other, we get out here and kill each other. Most of them are economic crimes, we understand that. And we know there's a lot of obstacles for our brothers, but let me just say this, because I don't let them off the hook with that nonsense, talking about the white man won't let me do this and somebody won't let me do that. Shut up! Yes, <laughs> talking about you tough. That sound like some punk shit. Excuse me. Excuse me. That's what it is. Y'all got these young men thinking that being tough is walking around here shooting and killing each other and this and that and the other. Fight against the real enemy. And the real enemy is anyone who will stand in front of the way of you obtaining progress and success. No color. Anybody could be the police. Stop and frisk laws when they're abusing you, then march in front of the police station. Don't go back to the hood and get mad with each other. Call each other punks, call each other snitch, and then shoot each other up. And then the man who's been waiting on you to kill yourselves, he just sits back there. He says, I'm going to let them kill each other and destroy each other so that my kids and my nephews and nieces can take the valuable resources of this country. We're going to lead them in the hood. In the drug infested, impoverished hood. That's what they want to be. Do you hear them? Look at their rap music. Lead them in the hood. Then we'll get all the riches of this country. Because they over there talking about the riches don't belong to them anyway. They saying that they don't want to be a part of this. They run around here talking about this is the white man's society. <laughs> Let them keep saying it, because indeed it is. We'll keep it if that's what they want to say. But let me tell you something about that, young man. Let me tell you something about that, and I'm going to close shortly. We got this thing, and I always have, about we, wanna, we don't want to be a part of the system. We want to be uh, in our hood, and we want to build, the, back in the day, the radicals, and, which I was somewhat one at, at the end of the radical days in the late 70s. One of five states in the South, that's all. Give us five states as reparation, da 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 da, da, da and then we'll be cool. How does that sound? Your forefathers built the entire country for free. That's why America's the richest country in the world, because it had free labor. Yes, sir. Yo, 
forefathers worked for free to build the richest country in the world. And you sound like a fool talking about all I want to do is stay in the hood. All I want is five states. You sound like a scary fool. You don't want just five states. We built this country. We want it all. We want to participate in it all. And we did it. I know I'm going to get in trouble with this, but I close. But you must know, young people, African Americans, black folks have won every struggle and everything we fought for. Yes, sir. That's why it's your turn to fight this struggle. We won emancipation from slavery under the leadership Harriet Tubman. Our modern day Harriet Tubman, our lover. <laughs> Frederick Douglass. We won emancipation from slavery. After slavery came segregation in the 50s and what have you. Dr. King, Civil Rights Movement, they fought, fought back, and they won the Civil Rights Act, which allowed opportunity in the mainstream economics of America. They won the Voting Rights Act. So we won everything we fought for. Fought for public accommodations and after we had been alienated through segregation from participating in mainstream America, 50 years later, two thirds of us are living prosperous lives, only 25% in poverty, when 50 years ago, right before the Civil Rights Movement, 75%, the overwhelming percent of us, percent of African Americans lived in poverty because they couldn't work downtown, couldn't work in the corporations. But we knocked those barriers down and now we're leading Fortune 500 companies. We're leading Merrill Lynch. We're leading American Express. We're leading Maxwell Coffee, CEOs. And so then came the Voting Rights Act. Prior to the passage of the Voting Rights Act, we had less than 1,000 black elected officials representing 22 million people 50 years ago. That's, that, 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 that's representation. Taxation without representation. That's what that is. And I see some of the young folks yawning and leaning back, but you need to listen because you're gonna get played if you don't get this knowledge. You know, you know, you know, young people, y'all know that show y'all like, Sucker Free? I'm trying to keep you from being a sucker. I'm trying to keep you sucker free. And so, Voting Rights Act, we won that war and took over the country with the President of the United States. We won everything we fought for. And so as I close, I want to tell my brothers, you can't give up, you can't punk out, yes, sir. can't lay down, it's time to throw down. I went through a lot of obstacles, you've heard my story, many of you, born and raised in the toughest housing projects in Detroit, four boys to a single mother, never had any association with my mother, I mean with my father, in and out of juvenile four or five times. Uh, my last encounter with the law was as an adult, tried as an adult, age 17, for carrying a gun. But at one point, I determined, particularly because of how it was hurting my mother, I said, I want to change my life. Read up, got the knowledge of those who had transformed their lives and made a contribution. I read about Malcolm X how he had been in prison and then came out and became a major leader of African-American community. That inspired me. And so once I began to get that knowledge and I got my GED and went to college on the Affirmative Action Program, that's a political program that we won. Yes, sir. And that's now with the Supreme Court, young people, I hope you know that. And the Supreme Court is likely to eliminate it 
So those of you who getting tired and sleepy, you need to know that you may not get in college if you're depending on affirmative action because it's about to be overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. I bet you need that knowledge. And so, after getting in college, got my bachelor's degree, got my law degree, had my record expunged, passed the bar exam, but they held me up, held up my law license for three years even though I had had my record expunged because it's a bar association, uh, we'll tell you, and that's an association. You have no legal right to join. They can take in whoever they want. I don't care if you got your record expunged or not. But I didn't give up. I didn't run back to the neighborhood and uh, uh, go to the store and drink my problems away. I didn't go to the crack house and smoke my problems away. I didn't go home and beat my woman out of frustration. I fought back against the real enemy. I fought back for three years until I won my right to practice law at the Michigan Supreme Court. Didn't give up. Didn't punk out. Didn't go to sleep. But they didn't stop there. After I began practicing law and decided a few years later I'd run for judge, here they came again. This time they gave my record to the news media to try and destroy my campaign. But it didn't work. I beat a 20 year incumbent by 10,000 votes. Why? Because I had served my community. They knew me. Make sure you're serving others too when you get yourself together. Bring it back to your community. Yeah, I made a couple of nickels and moved out of the ghetto. I shouldn't have lived in the ghetto with a couple of nickels. But I came back to the ghetto, build a community center, help redevelop housing. So make sure you bring it back, young people, if you take it away and empower yourselves. But I didn't give up, I fought back until I won. And you young people can do the same thing. I want you to be like that bling bling you like so much. You know how that's made, the bling bling? Well, it's dug up from the ground. That's why they call it diamond in the rough. Dug up from the ground. And once they dig it up, that piece of dirt covered rock, they put it through the heaviest pressure and the hottest fire known to man. And once they put it through that heavy pressure and that hot fire, when it comes out on the end of that process, yes, it becomes glistening gold and diamonds, the most precious metals and, and jewels in the world. So you know, I want you to be like that bling bling that you like so much. Go through the fire of these streets that you have to deal with. Go through the pressure of those who would have you otherwise to destroy yourselves. Don't you fight in a way that will destroy you. Fight in a way that will uplift you. Go through it. Be that gold. Be that diamond. Don't give up. Fight back. Lift yourselves up, and if you do, you too will achieve the opportunity that God has in store for you. Thank you for listening, and God bless you. Judge Greg Mathis, give it up for Judge Greg Mathis. What a message and what a man. Strong men make a difference. Strong men make a difference. You know what, there's a Greg Mathis in this room out of these young men. I believe there's another Judge Greg Mathis in the making in this room. Thank you so much, Judge Mathis, for that message. The Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show.